They are the kings of the Australian outback. You've got to concentrate all the time. Some of the biggest trains in the world. If things go wrong with these things, normally makes a big mess. On epic journeys through a hostile continent. I don't know what we're going to do. We slow down and blow the horn. A nation depends on them. All oh good, boys, get into it. And the teams that keep these metal monsters on the tracks. Yeah! Hauling huge loads of food, freight and mineral riches across incredible distances. We are out in the middle of nowhere, that's for sure. Big trains, big country. Railroad Australia. History under attack. A steam joyride turns ugly. Who do that to something like this, you know? Drama in the outback. Whoa, whoa, hey, 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 hey. Did you get it? And for a 2,000 tonne freight train. If something goes wrong, it's pretty serious. There's danger on the rails. With headlights on, horns blazing, and they still come out. They're nearly 70 years old, but these ageing beauties still turn heads. Magnificent steam-breathing monsters with fire burning in their bellies. They look good and they make a lot of noise and they go very fast. Their sounds and smells once brought the city of Melbourne alive. The romance died when the golden age of steam gave way to diesel. But once a year, they get all dressed up again for a special outing. Uh, the snow train steamrail's biggest steam train trip for the year and it's critical to us for our future. The snow train runs from the city centre, 130 kilometres to the station of Moi, where passengers join buses for a trip to the snow country. The vintage steam engines that pull the snow train each cost more than $2 million to restore, and mechanic John Grayling has the job of making sure they stay running. These boilers were built just after the war, in Britain actually, because we didn't have the, uh, enough materials and manpower here. The steel was not of high quality. They were all from melted down tanks with all sorts of impurities and so on, and these boilers caused a lot of trouble. And they still can. Keeping them running is hugely expensive. Without money from ticket sales on the snow train, these engines would have to be mothballed and never seen working again. The, the locomotives are the big stars tomorrow. They attract all the attention. We expect the hundreds of people to come out and see us pass through tomorrow. But the grand old trains have also attracted some unwanted attention. We've had two bad fires this year, which has really knocked us around a lot. Vandals have twice attacked the sheds the trains and carriages are kept in. The last fire was just last Saturday, where we lost two carriages in that and a large storage area. Um, unfortunately, that was deliberately lit. There are some volunteers whose carriages were completely destroyed. And I think that's very sad, because it was their life's work, you know? Tomorrow, when the snow train runs, these hard-working volunteers hope their luck will change and months of work will be rewarded. From urban Melbourne, 3,000 kilometres north, where the Savannah Lander is once again barreling through the wide brown plains of northern Queensland. It's a small train 
with a huge job. A weekly expedition with its drivers Will and Lee into the far reaches of the outback. They start their four-day return trip in the coastal city of Cairns and run 400 kilometres inland to the historic mining town of Forsyth. But this morning, before it's even left its home base of Cairns... Any of on there got a copy? Yeah, copy, Mike. Yeah, you need to put your uh, rear markers on it. There's a problem at the back of the train that has to be fixed before they can go anywhere. Um, it just looks like we've just forgotten to flick the battery switch on back here. No, that's on. But on the back of your train, you'll have, uh, like, a red indicator light. It's obviously showing people that that is the, the very back of the train. Lee calls back to base for help. Yeah, yeah, whites are good, ditch is good, headlights good, uh, everything else is fine. But the advice from the technician isn't very technical. The instruction is to wiggle the wires. No. Very technical fix of wiggling hasn't fixed them at all. Although tourists make up the bulk of its passengers, the Savannah Lander is a scheduled train, a community service, which means it does the journey even if bookings are low. It can't just be cancelled. Even these times of year when the tourist season has sort of died off, um, we don't have the, the numbers that we normally do, we still operate the train because a lot of locals out west will still use a train, depend on us. See ya! Some of the remote towns on the line still rely on the service as public transport to send freight and deliver mail. One faulty light could throw the Savannah Lander's schedule into chaos. From the steamy tropics of North Queensland, back to Melbourne, where freight train drivers Paul Matley and Mark Wolverson have an early morning start on a run to the wheat fields of Western Victoria. Yeah, we're going down to Swanson Dock to pick up our loading and then we're going to do a five-hour trip to Orsham, where we'll drop the wagons off. They have to deliver 54 empty containers to an agricultural depot at Horsham. Then, after a fast four-hour loading, the train will make the 300-kilometre journey back to the Melbourne docks. Farmers who've grown millions of dollars worth of grain and hay for the rich Asian market rely on this service running like clockwork every day of the harvest season. If the train is delayed, produce worth hundreds of thousands of dollars could miss the boat. And livelihoods out here would suffer. Paul and Mark's loco rattles through the slumbering suburbs down to the dockyards that never rest. At the port, the wagons and empty containers are all linked up. I got lined up. Once the loco attaches, it's officially a train. Red light. We're hooked up and we'll be ready to go as soon as we get the brake certificate. OK, Mark, thanks for coming off the last three. I'll come off and give you some boom gates. Roger. Now we're a full-blown train. 538 metres. The safety checks cost valuable time, but they're not negotiable. If you're playing with, you know, heavy machinery, you know, generally if something goes wrong, it's pretty serious. The sun is rising, and soon, so will the city. Mark and Paul have nearly 100 kilometres of busy suburban track to get through. With commuters and countless level crossings, it's a dangerous time. They'll be on high alert for the next hour. Oh, yeah, you get a few idiots, but touch wood. Got to keep alert, got to concentrate, be aware. 
300 kilometers away, the sun is rising over fields of wheat, hay and other crops. But there are clouds around and a forecast for heavy rain. Bad for harvesting and not good weather for loading trains in a hurry. And the situation's not looking good at the Melbourne end either. Paul and Mark have run into a hold-up. It's a busy morning and train control have given them a red light. Progress is now out of their control. Uh, we wait for the train to come past and then we can go on our merry way. A passenger train and then another freighter. Both have been given priority. There's nothing they can do except sit and wait. In Melbourne, restored steam engines R761 and R711 are being readied for a make or break fundraising run to the bottom of the Victorian Alps. Joined together, the two locos will have a combined pull of nearly 4,000 horsepower. They'll tow 14 carriages and more than 500 guests on the annual trip known as the snow train. They may be nearly 70 years old, but these antique warriors are still capable of hitting speeds of 115 kilometers an hour. But it's reliability rather than speed that their owners will be looking for on this journey. Old novelty trains running on busy modern networks still have to play by strict rules. Even to get out of the Newport Yards here is a challenge for us that uh, we've got to fit in between Metro's uh, suburban trains. They have to stick to tight timetables like everyone else. Miss your slot and you could be waiting a long time for another one. Basically we can be parked off, off in a siding and have to wait till we get another, another clear path to run again. So we could be delayed uh, one or two hours. Making the organisers nervous is that despite a 1990s conversion from coal to oil burner, to make it faster and more reliable, the lead loco R711 has a reputation of being temperamental. The oil burner has been in storage for a number of years. To run an engine which hasn't seen a lot of service this year is, is um, a little bit of a concern. They may take joy rides, but these beasts are not toys. There's incredible heat and pressure inside the huge boilers, and that's an explosive combination the volunteers have to be wary of. Because it expands about nearly a centimetre in, in length as it heats up. So that means all of those riveted joints are being stressed and, and pulled apart, and these boilers the water level gets down past a certain point, the boiler will start coming apart and there's an immense amount of energy and become airborne and leave the locomotive and travel for, there are records of it travelling one or two hundred metres. Last minute work on the locos and carriages goes on into the night. The preparations are over. The big test is tomorrow. In Western Victoria, the freight train driven by Paul Matley and Mark Wolverson has hit another frustrating delay. After being held up for a passenger and a freight train on Melbourne's outskirts, they're only 50 kilometres down the track when they're ordered into another siding. And there's another delay. Coming to the loop here at Barwon Park, waiting for the train, the freight train that's coming from Adelaide. Paul and Mark are on a tight deadline. The empty containers the loco is pulling have to be delivered to a depot four hours away, where they'll be filled with grain and hay and sent back to Melbourne as quickly as possible. Yeah, right, boy. Good there on the two one. All complete. OK, mate, thanks a lot. Near the railway siding they're heading for, there's frantic activity. Oh, well, we're flat out. We're running two 11-hour shifts a day. Hundreds of tonnes of hay is being processed and loaded into containers, ready for the train's arrival. 
We've got uh, shipping schedules to meet. Get it on the train, it'll get it to port at the correct time. Each year, Australian farmers export more than $30 billion worth of food for humans and animals. This hay is headed for the lucrative Asian region to feed dairy cattle and other livestock. Taiwan, Korea, the Middle East and China. China's a growing market. But first, every bale needs to be x-rayed to make sure it's just food and nothing else. Wood, metal, uh, dirt, they're the main contaminants. Stock can eat them and it can uh, kill cows. Workers are also flat out at the nearby grain loading facility, packing wheat, barley, lentils and other grains to be sent to the rail depot. We've got train deadlines that we need to meet. The work becomes more urgent as the forecast rain starts to close in. It promises to end three years of crippling drought, but harvest time is the worst time for a big wet. Two hundred kilometres away, the SBR train is finally on the move again. They're out in the countryside, but at this speed, with a train this size, they still can't relax. You don't concentrate, something will happen, and something will go wrong. Hitting a stray kangaroo won't derail a train this size. But the loco could easily be damaged, bringing the journey to an expensive standstill. Despite the stopping and starting, Paul and Mark deliver the train to the depot on time. They've done their bit. Now the race is on to remove the empty containers and replace them with loaded ones. 40 feet. It's freight supervisor Craig Scott's job to make sure the unloading and reloading run on time. Four hours to turn this train around, get the empties off, the loaded ones on it. Four hours is a tight turnaround in good conditions. But now the rain has hit. In the wet, everything slows down and there's no sign of a break. We'll just get a little bit wet. So. <laughs> On the Savannah Lander, drivers Lee and Will have a faulty rear light and can't start their journey until it's fixed. Let's go to the boss a call. He's um, gets sending out our guy who deals mostly with the electrical side of the train. That'll mean a delay, which Lee doesn't want. Should we give it another wiggle, just in case? <laughs> you know what happens, like, every single time you do this, they say, oh, yeah, give it a wiggle or give it a kick or whatever. You come down and you wiggle. It's on. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to check one last time. Problem solved. It's on to Cairns Station. In tourist season, there's barely a spare seat but this week's service is nearly empty. Only three uh, official passengers, I guess, for, for the entire trip. This morning, we're heading up the McAllister Range, up into uh, Coranda. It is prone to landslips and rock falls and mudslides, those sorts of things. So before every train either heads up the range or down the range, they do send a high rail vehicle first. I've got a, tra a track inspector. He goes off first. Um, he's still heading up in front of us now. And he reports regularly to train control in Townsville, letting them know that the track is, is fit and safe for service. The country out here is rough. And so is the road ahead. The rails that we're travelling across get smaller. Uh, they get lighter in the amount of steel that's used in them, which means that they're not as rigid. They support our weight fine. It's very safe. But we do tend to start bouncing up and down a lot, so that reduces the speed that we can do. 
The track is 100 years old in parts and needs constant maintenance. That often means workers on the track. And that's a danger Lee and Will need to be warned about. In Melbourne, steam train volunteers have been up well before the sun, making the final preparations for the most important day of their year. Train manager Lionel Camilleri knows there is a lot riding on this event. Big day for us here at Steam Rail, taking the train up there, up towards the mountains. Uh, we've got about 500 people uh, booked on board this morning. Everything possible has been done to have the locos in perfect working order. But they're relics from another era, and the lead engine, R711, has been modified to burn oil instead of coal making her a complicated beast that only a few drivers have managed to tame. One of them is Andrew Johnson. I actually helped restore this engine. Uh, the problem we've had is that we've only had about four people who are qualified to run this engine. Fireman Mark Banford will be at Andrew's side today and he's still learning. I've only been on it once before and that was my main instruction. Mark has one of the most critical jobs on a steam train. My job today will be to um, attend to the fire. This one's an oil burner. Making sure the giant boiler doesn't overheat. You have to keep the water up to it all the time. We'll be feeding water into the boiler the whole time it's working, keeping that boil, uh, water level up to a safe level. Burning oil instead of coal should help the drivers. The oil fire is more responsive and easier to control, but Andrew knows things can easily go wrong. I find with oil burning locomotives that if they're running well, they run very well, and if they're not, you can have a really bad day. As she lumbers onto the main Melbourne rail network, R711 is carrying nearly 10,000 litres of oil and weighs close to 200 tonnes. It's like a cart horse on a racetrack. Taking the train on a modern network uh, certainly has its challenges. It's busier than ever. Uh, the speed of the other trains is higher than it ever was. Um, we have what we call a path, which is our scheduled pathway through the system. If something goes wrong today and causes a delay to regular services, the big old trains of the past may not be so welcome next time. If you have problems, uh, a locomotive failure or something, and you get too far out of your slot, it's called losing your path and then all bets are off. It could take you all night to get home. 530 passengers join the train at Melbourne's Flinders Street Station. Ahead of them, a three hour journey to the town of Mowie. Yeah, so you've got plenty of time. It's, yeah, uh, that's, that's on, on. You've got about, you know, over three and a half hours. And for the snow lovers, a bus ride up to the ski fields. To synchronise the two locomotives uh, takes a degree of skill. Um, we use uh, visual cues, whistle codes. They're now cruising at 80 kilometres an hour. It's literally full steam ahead as they power towards the city's outskirts. But the buzz of getting it all right is about to be shattered by something they can't control. In Western Victoria, the rain that's hampered the loading of the SBR grain and hay train has finally let up. Now the priority is to get the fully laden train back to the docks as quickly as possible but new driver, 28-year-old Justin Pendergast, has to check the loco first. Oh, uh, the engine room. Yeah, just check it before we start her up. Just make sure everything's fine with the engine. 20 cylinder, four stroke. Fire her up. So. Everything seems in order, except it won't start. It's uh, not talking to us. 
Justin tries the ignition button again and all he gets is more silence. It's a 4,000 horsepower giant of an engine worth nearly $5 million. But Justin is hoping the solution to this problem is no different to how you deal with a misbehaving home computer. I'm just going to kill it and start again. A quick reboot. Sounds better. Justin's driving partner, Peter Mulhill, has walked the length of the train to check the brakes on each of the 23 wagons. Just um, walking around the locomotive, making sure there's nothing un going underneath it, making sure all the brake locks are there and like goes all ready to go. Before they move out of the yard, everything must be double checked. So we know that all our containers are so all secure. We're not going to have a container bouncing off on the side of the track. Got the signal down there, we're right to head off out of the main line and back to Melbourne, so uh, let's go. The line the train is running on is the main one between Adelaide and Melbourne. In country areas of Australia, there are often no gates at level crossings or even flashing warning lights. That can be a problem. Every now and then, you know, people do disregard the bells or they're on their phone, not concentrating, and unfortunately, yeah, you know, a lot of these unmarked little crossings around these country areas are probably the worst. In my 28 years of driving, I've had two level crossing crashes and also a suicide. Second one was actually on this, on this track. A uh, person had turned onto the main road, which was straight on the level crossing, and he'd actually gone through the boom gates and crashed those and stopped in front of us hit him, he went off onto the, into the paddock with his car and uh, he actually had to be cut out of his car, but he survived okay. With headlights on, horns blazing and they still come out. But this morning, it's not people they need to worry about. It's got, it's got some sheep up ahead. It's about six of them, it looks like. Right out, yep. Some stray stock on the line. At this speed, there's nothing they can do except sound the horns and hope the animals don't turn the wrong way. On the outskirts of Melbourne, the snow train was running on time and approaching maximum cruising speed when this happened. It seems unbelievable. The train attacked by people on a bridge. Not one, but two bricks, scoring direct hits. The shaken drivers, Mark and Andrew, will have to stop the train and assess the damage. The other engine and carriages could also have been targets. Train manager Lionel gets the bad news. The trip could be over. The driver's supervisor was sort of letting me know before that we may or may not be able to continue the journey, so uh, basically the decision of that will be up to the drivers. Went under a bridge and some uh, two individuals have thrown uh, two bricks off the bridge, it seems, and uh, aimed at smashing our windows. They've hit both windows and broken them, but they're bulletproof glass, so they haven't completely smashed, but they are cracked. It's just as well it is that type of glass, otherwise we could have been in a lot of trouble. Andrew, I'm just going to have a quick look around this side, just as long as they don't pop out. After an incident like that, we'll be looking for damage to any systems on the locomotive, so anything that might be safety critical to the operation of the train. Some rotten sods have uh, thrown a couple of bricks off the bridge and uh, bullseye. Who do that to something like this, you know? Lionel has to prepare for the worst scenario that all the months of hard work by volunteers to make this important day a success could be ruined by a couple of mindless vandals. Very upsetting for us, a bit devastating I suppose, because it's one of these things that could stop the train from, from proceeding any further. But these old trains were built tough. Cracked glass is the only damage. The decision is made to carry on. 
well, I had a chat to the drivers and the, the driver supervisor. Um, they're pretty confident that they still can continue. Good news for us, we can actually keep the journey going and you know, it's, it's very relieving, I suppose, because all the work that goes into getting these trains to run, that sort of thing, um, to have you know someone come along and just try and take that away from you, just like that, it's, uh, it's pretty terrible. The stop has cost the snow train precious time. Time it needs to make up to stick to the strict schedule enforced by train control. But if we don't run to schedule, uh, they can sort of, you know, we, we basically have to sit, sit and wait until there's a, a free path for us to fit into on the network. The snow train ploughs on, picking up speed. It's finally back on schedule, but not for long. We've just experienced a signal failure on the, on the network. We have to pull up at the signal uh, and get permission basically to proceed into the next section. First vandals, now signal failure. The snow train is stopped again. In far north Queensland. The Savannah Landers drivers have just been given a warning that's impossible to ignore. I wish they'd told us they were there. Small charges have been laid on the track. The gangs that fix things out here put them out so that they know that they've got our attention. So as you go over them, they're just gunpowder inside of a little uh, cap. And as our wheels go over, it crushes it, and of course, boom. Um, it's just another way of making sure. Yeah, I can see an orange shirt down the end of the, um, the straight down there. So they're out there doing something. All they're doing is protecting their work site. So they hear the boom, boom back there, clear off. Hey, you go. As the train heads deeper into the outback, the fields are replaced by more extreme country. The line cuts dramatically through rocky outcrops. Here, pioneers carved out a path through near impossible country. These guys came out here with picks and shovels and they're digging through super hard volcanic rock and building railway lines through areas that people today can't even be really, you know, you, you wouldn't get people out here doing that job now. And these guys are out here 100 years ago moving rock and making these absolutely perfect railway alignments and it hasn't changed in that entire time. The Savannah Lander's first overnight stop is a tiny town called Almaden. A town where there are more cattle than people at the station. My job is to keep the platform nice and clean for the tourists. The nickname for uh, Almaden is Cowtown. There's a lot of uh, cow pats, as you can see, around the place. Cattle in this town that's not fenced. Cattle just wander all around the place. The next morning, during the pre-departure checks, Will discovers the rough ride the previous day has taken its toll. So you see here, I've had one of the sander tubes come off. The tubes are used to spray sand onto the rails to help the wheels grip when the tracks are wet. I see the vibrated off or it's gotten caught on a stick or a branch, something like that, dragged along the track for a while. They are a vital piece of equipment and it looks like they're going to be needed. There's rain forecast for Forsyth this afternoon and it certainly looks very promising uh, in the direction that we are travelling. We will have to repair that. It's a bad start to the day. Do we have any hose to repair that with? Doesn't look like it. Um, if we don't have a, a pipe to replace this. We are going to be driving into rain and with a portion of our sanding equipment not functioning correctly at the moment, uh, it could complicate things down the track. As it's only one pipe, they carry on. 
The next section is the most isolated part of the trip. The bush is wild and the rails unfenced. We'll take it cautiously, keep our eyes out and yeah, hopefully everything's okay. The Savannah Lander rarely does speeds over 40 kilometres an hour. And this is why. Whoa, whoa, hey, 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 hey. Did you get it? In Western Victoria. It's got, it's got some sheep up ahead. What's about six of them, it looks like. A much bigger, faster train is about to run into the same trouble. A bunch of wayward sheep have strayed onto the line. Pete will give them a bit of a toot and they should get out of the way. If they run the wrong way, they have no chance. One, two, six. It's a close shave for these farm escapades. I would just have to report that now so that the farmer knows that he's probably got a hole in the fence. Any control reading you there, 7922 over? Yeah, Brent, uh, 7922 at Berrybank, mate. Just want to report some livestock on the line, over. Yeah, oh, they got out of the way uh, between the 153 and the 154 peak. We've got six sheep, mate, over. And obviously, if one's getting out, then more are going to get out. So, uh, you know, it caused damage to the train and obviously he's going to lose livestock. So, yeah, they'll, they'll get onto that now, hopefully. After dealing with the sheep drama, the drivers hit the outskirts of Melbourne. Now it's people they have to look out for. We'll have to be uh, extra cautious going through the town. There's a lot of level crossings. A lot of people are going to work. Uh, they have to keep a sharp eye out, make sure we use the horn a lot. Finally, the city skyscrapers come into distant view. There's one last task. Yeah, 1,800 tonnes of... Uh hay and other stuff up from the uh, Wimmera region. Delivered down the dock shortly. You're just about to go over the crossing, all clear. Roger. In the harvest season, the hay and grain trains provide an essential daily shuttle between one of the state's richest agricultural areas and the docks. Without a reliable service, a multi-million dollar export earner would be in jeopardy. On this trip, a bad run of signals, pouring rain during loading, and a few suicidal sheep haven't been able to stop the grain train. The ships carrying hundreds of tonnes of farm product will sail for overseas markets on time. Obviously, you know, there's nothing better than having the train fully loaded, going in the docks. In far north Queensland, the Savannah Lander has run into cattle on the track. Whoa, whoa, hey, 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 hey. Did you get it? He's good. Slapped him on the bum as he walked past. There's damage but it's not something new. That bit there was already there, so we're, we're all good. The Savannah Lander has three overnight stops on its trip. The last is at a place called Mount Surprise. And in the morning, there's a nasty surprise waiting for Will. Check this out. It's got a young Northern Death Adder. Death Adders didn't get their name from being harmless. Quite a, a toxic little animal, certainly not something you want to get bitten by. But Will isn't scared. You got my hook, Lee. Cheers. He's a former zookeeper and has his own reptile collection at home. I got tagged by one of these little guys, um, purely my fault. But um, I did get very, very sick. A couple of days in intensive care. We might um, pop him in a bag and just take him a little bit further out of town. This is one passenger the boys will be happy to get rid of quickly. There's a, a couple of old car wrecks up here on the, the left-hand side of the track. Once the sun goes down, he'll move out and hope to find himself a new little spot to call home. Closer to its home base of Cairns, the Savannah Lander runs into a new hazard. It's had cattle and snakes on the tracks. 
now it's tourists. Legging it, trying to get to the platform before we get there. A really dangerous activity. After four days, another wild outing is completed. We made it back just about exactly on our normal scheduled time. On one of Australia's most unusual trains. Yeah. Communities depend on us, so it doesn't matter how hot it is, yeah. we'll be out there doing it again. Outside Melbourne, the setbacks continue for the snow train. It's been stopped because of a signal failure. People there from the railways in the midst of fixing the signal. Train manager Lionel and the drivers can do nothing but sit and wait. Uh, once they get the appropriate permissions, then the train can proceed on uh, as per normal. Eventually, the signal problem is fixed and the snow train is given a green light. It's now running even later. But at least out here in the countryside, the two big steam locomotives can be let loose. <laughs> We're a little bit, a little bit uh, late at one point. By the time we arrive in Maui, uh, I imagine we'll be all on time. It's bang on time. We've got about 230 people hopping off the train here. They will then hop onto some buses and head up to the snow for the day. But while they're away playing, there's work to be done. The train has to head 30 kilometres up the line to the town of Traralgon. An old-fashioned turntable is used to spin the locomotives around so they can head back the other way. I'm very, very happy that we got the train here. I consider that my job is a success and that I've done the job I was put here to do. With the two locos refueled and the passengers back on board, the snow train starts the three hour run back to Melbourne. It's dark by the time it announces its return to the city after a journey nearly derailed by brick-throwing vandals. There'll be two windows to fix when they get back to the depot, but the two steam locos haven't missed a beat on the 200-kilometre round trip. For us, it's been, a, I guess, a, a big day, challenging day, all that sort of stuff. The annual run to the snow by steam has delighted all those on board and hundreds along the line. Twelve hours after they left their depot, the panting, puffing billies are back in the sheds, resting up for their next outing. You know, in the future we'll be able to hopefully uh, continue running these heritage trains and I guess it pays off for us. Next time on Railroad Australia. She's uh, playing hardball today. Loco trouble. Oh, you bastard. The worst possible place to break down. On patrol along the loneliest rail line on earth. It's no man's land. Once you get out past the last cattle station, you're on your own. And a blast from the past. <laughs> as driver Bernie is reunited with an old friend.